curious about birds. I mean, if you're not curious about birds, then you might be in the wrong place. Um, and I, I don't know, maybe if you are just like a little bit curious and unsure, then hopefully this presentation or this conversation will inspire you to really take flight into your adventure of discovering our winged friends because they're everywhere, they're all around us, they're inspiring, they're a great way to connect with nature. Um, and unfortunately, you know, life's pretty tough from them. And so, you know, there's lots that we can be doing to help as well. So I can just tell you maybe a, a little bit about myself here. I'm just gonna pull up my, my presentation while I do that. Um, yeah, my name's Matthew, I work with Alex. We work at a, an outdoor school in Guelph. Um, my, my profession by trade is, ooh, let me just get this chat thing out of the way. You can still hear me, okay, excellent. Um, yeah, I'm a biologist by trade and a birder, well, both like for work and for fun and just well, for everything. You just, once you really get into it, you can't even turn it off. It's like, it's compulsive. But um, long story short, I grew up in the UK, uh, went to study, grew up in South Wales, went to study zoology in Liverpool, England and stayed there for five years. And mostly I was, more into insects, I was more into beer actually at, at university and, and gigs and just having fun and then really got into insects towards the end and conservation and ecology. Um, I ended up going to work um, in 2008 in the Amazon rainforest, mostly with insects and snakes and frogs. And I ended up getting totally distracted by the birds down there. They were so, the colors were amazing. They were loud, they were everywhere. There was ID guides where you could actually like actually see what I was trying to identify with a lot of the insects I had to catch them it was a real challenge the books weren't there I didn't have the mentors for it but um, I had a pretty inspiring experience down there and it really changed my opinion growing up in the UK I had a very dismal view of birders as like very kind of dry British old tweed clad folks and it was just a very uninspiring thing and I was very like conscious to not become a bird watcher all that time, despite it being like an ever present like thing in my life and a temptation, I was always like, I'm not gonna do that. And then I met some inspiring characters, had some amazing experiences, and then came to Canada after a year in the rainforest. And I moved to Ottawa in the middle of December after the first snow. And I was like, what am I doing here? But then I saw a cardinal, a blue jay. I joined the local naturalist club. A um, bunch of fantastic retired folks took me out, took me under their wing and like showed me a lot of the local birds even there in winter and they were still like spectacularly colorful and then I discovered like migration and all the warblers and stuff about the boreal forest that's north of us here and just how it's all connected and yeah I've really just kind of plunged into it here in Canada I work a bit in consulting I work a lot now in environmental education and using birds as a way to inspire people to be more aware of their footprints, um, take a little bit of ownership for our impact upon the land, um, whilst also having fun and like, yeah, getting to know wildlife and benefiting our own you know, mental health. It's all there. Birds can help you with all that. So I just want this presentation basically to be a little bit of an introduction for folks who are curious about like, what is birding? How can I get into it? Maybe you're a little like put off like I was, I don't know. And I think we've all had a bit more time during this pandemic to like notice the birds are around us. So maybe you're curious already and maybe this will just kind of steer you and um, yeah, give you, a, give you some ideas of the resources that are out there to help you get to know these birds. Um, I'm excited to be working with Alex at uh, the school and also at the trip shed. And we've got a, an, an exciting trip planned for the summer. I'm gonna tell you more about that later. Um, so, Wow, I kind of like talked about this stuff already. I'm just so excited and it's really hard to just like not like talk about what's on my mind sometimes and I get a bit distracted, but I don't know. Let's see, why birds? Yeah, birds are everywhere. Everywhere you go in the world, they're there um, in your backyard, in your city parks or in your nature areas. If you go up into the wilderness, there's about Algonquin, birds are everywhere. Um, there's lots of resources and there are pretty Compared to plants, I mean, maybe Nikki will correct me on this and uh, maybe others will correct me if I'm talking about other forms of wildlife, insects, you know, but with birds, 
you know, the resources are really there and they're very accessible, particularly now with the way the internet has taken over birding. And let's see, and it's kind of led to like a lot of more connection of community as well. And so that's a pretty exciting thing. Birds are excellent indicators of environmental health. If the birds aren't doing well, then we know that the land's not doing so well. So it's important to be aware of what they're up to because it can deepen our understanding of our impact, as I said. The, the, the marvels of migration. I mean, a lot of us maybe think of migration as just being like the return of the robins and the blackbirds, but spring migration is three or four months long. We're just kind of coming to the, the crux of it now, like the peak in these next few, wow, possibly tomorrow actually might be one of the busiest days of the year in terms of like warblers just flooding through Southern Ontario, possibly like 4 million birds passing through our area like tonight and traveling, you know, hundreds of kilometers overnight. So hopefully a bunch of them stay here and we get to see them tomorrow. Um, are you on these admin things, Alex? Just checking, awesome, cool, thank you. Um, also, yeah, bird language and song is beautiful. Um, you know, it's all around us. It can really just like make our day when we wake up and hear the birds singing, apart from maybe those really irritating cardinals that are outside your window, four o'clock on a, <laughs> July morning, but um, also bird language can help us like connect with those birds deeper and help us like identify what they are without even having to see them. It's a, an amazing thing and it's really something to tap into, um, but don't be put off by it. It's not, it's not scary. You don't need to know every bird song to connect or, or to be a birder, not by any means at all. And hopefully I can kind of get that point across in this as well. Uh, we talked about nature connection, mental health, it's obvious. And there was a study out recently, the more species of birds you see in a day or in a week, the happier you're going to be. Um, citizen science, by, by being curious, we can contribute to a greater understanding, a greater kind of awareness of how the birds are doing. And that can inform um, conservation action and can inspire others to um, look after our winged friends and all of nature. Um, and I've talked about my moment of inspiration and these photos actually were from, from my time in Ecuador, my first two weeks that I was there. And actually this is the day that I made my first ever bird list. And all these parrots were coming into this clay lick, um, which is like a, a rocky cavern with like salty minerals. And they're coming down to peck at the minerals to, di to help with their digestion. And we kind of crept in there with a guide. There was like 20 of us and a bunch of other tourists. You had to be super quiet. We were up at the crack of dawn cruising along a tributary of the Amazon in this misty smoke, uh, misty morning um, on a motorized canoe. We come into the clay lick and the birds start coming down. First of all, just one or two parrots, eventually like a whole horde of them. And eventually like there was up to like eight different species of parakeets, parrots and parakeets, including these cobalt winged ones, the beautiful wings. Um, and a couple of scarlet macaws came in and then eventually everything went silent and a hawk swooped in. I don't know if it hit one of the parrots or what, but all of the parrots just left. And the guy just turned us to us and was like, that's it, show over. But I was like, wow, this is, this is awesome. So, I mean, you might not be lucky enough to do something like that, but now is the time to see birds that are coming from the tropics and going all the way to the boreal forest, beautiful warblers, and they're passing through your cities and parks and through Southern Ontario or probably wherever you are. If, if you want to throw in the chat, actually, as to, to where we all are, I'd be quite curious. But I guess a lot of people here are probably in southern Ontario. But yeah, these birds are passing through right now. Now's the time to see neotropical birds in your neighborhood. And they're only going to be passing through for a few weeks of the year. So it's, it's a super exciting time. Why birding rather than just bird watching? Um, one of my mentors once said this to me, birding is not an activity, but a state of mind. I think he was joking, but also deadly serious. You might need to know him to really find that amusing, but I don't know. I think it's a good, I think it's a good mindset to have. Uh, you don't necessarily want to think like I'm going out birding right now, but you could just be out for a walk and you could be just noticing the birds a bit more than you were pre-pandemic or before this presentation or whatever. Birding is for everyone. You don't need to be an expert. You don't need to know them all. You can just start off in your backyard and that might be as far as you want to go. The birds that come to your feeder or you might want to start crazy life lists and 
go on voyages to Point Pelee or to the Amazon rainforest or whatever. The choice is yours. You choose your own level of involvement. Where do I start? A notebook is probably a most important tool. If you really wanna to get to know what you're seeing, there's other things that are gonna be super useful, but a notebook is, do not underestimate it. Particularly if you're just starting out, and particularly if you're like, I don't know if I wanna drop the money on some binoculars or get a, a book. Maybe you're just a little bit inspired, make some notes, see what you, write down what you see, make little lists, maybe just do sketches, but hold on to that book because the more, the deeper you go, you're gonna really wanna make more and more notes and refer back to your starting point and see how your journey progresses. Um, Birding apps are becoming huge now and there's some really good options. I don't really use them, so I'm mostly going on the recommendation of others. Um, and we'll dive into that a bit. I should keep my own time here. Um, there's some really good options out there. Some of them you pay for, some are free. Um, but field guides are also great and they have certain advantages. We'll look at that in a minute as well. Wow, this is, I can just blast through this. Binoculars, it's obvious. Like they're gonna really enable you to see more things, but Again, it's not an essential part. If you just want to look at the birds in your yard or where you're out for a little hike in your park, don't feel intimidated by not having binoculars. You can be a birder, you can enjoy birds without one. Camera, same thing, you don't need a huge lens, but a camera can be really useful, especially like if you, if you don't yet have binoculars. Um, and again, bird feeders can be a useful way to bring birds to you, bring them into your yard. But we're not gonna to touch on that too much this evening, but do like find a good resource and like know what you're doing and keep them clean. Keeping your bird feeders clean is key. And also you're gonna probably attract other friends, squirrels, maybe raccoons, and whether you want them there or not, they're gonna come. But some feeders are squirrel proof, others are not. And even the squirrel proof ones aren't really. <laughs> um, field guides. Let's see, the World of Field Guides started with this guy, James, John, John James Audubon and the Birds of America. We can't really talk about field guides without talking about him. Um, he made engraved paintings, life size of 435 of the 490 species. He discovered 25 new species. Um, unfortunately, he shot them all before drawing them. Um, but that was kind of the nature of science at the time. Um, they were printed between 1827 and 1839, so it goes quite a while back. And you can't really, his name's going to pop up as you get into the word of, world of birds, whether it's field guides or the American Audubon Society. You do need to acknowledge as well that he was a slave owner. Uh, he denied talk of abolition and had held white supremacist views. Um, so you can't really talk about Audubon without acknowledging those things. Um, but what he did was remarkable and the, the drawings are just like incredible when you do look at them. Um, and it really like kickstarted the, like the desire for people to, to have a, a better understanding. Fast forward a hundred years and Roger Torrey Peterson published in 1934, um, the Field Guide to Birds the first painted, um, well, not the first painted, obviously, but like the first like accessible, readily available one book version of, this, of a field guide in the world, um, super accessible. I mean, I don't know how accessible it was to people back then or whether it was affordable or not, I think so, you know, that's going quite a ways back and it was publishing is different then, but fantastic piece of work. And like, it's been updated a lot recently, you can get modern versions of it. He only passed away a few years ago. He had quite a long, rich life and there's tons of other Peterson field guides. They're all pretty good. And he really kind of was the first one to just lay the paintings out clearly so you can compare side by side and even threw in all these like nice little arrows. You can do these really easy comparisons. Um, and then a few years later, and this is kind of my go-to field guide, the Sidley guide. It's just beautiful. Like the maps are clear. The drawings are beautiful. Again, all painted. It's kind of, it's a lot of birders go to, and it's a really good, accessible, pocket friendly. You know, it's a little bit smaller. It's just like a couple of inches smaller than the Peterson, but it does fit into your pocket so much better. So that's kind of why I've gone with it. 
I don't have my copy of it with me, but you should see it. It's like battered. It's seen a lot of wear over the last 10 years, but I definitely recommend it. The second edition's out now. You can get the pocket friendly East or West version or um, like the continental wide one, but that's more of a coffee table thing. So that's something to think about. Yeah, do you want a pocket size version or like a coffee table book? There's some books which are just massive and you would never take out into the field, but they're great fun to look at in the evening. Uh, painted versus photos, like they both have their benefits. Painted, everything's easy to compare. Every bird is drawn in the same position, um, but it's not necessarily lifelike. Um, photographs are gonna give you a more accurate, accurate representation of like what birds are actually like in the wild. I mean, there's a pretty good one here. Yeah, the Stokes guide, that's an excellent photo um, guide. And then you might also want to consider, do you want a regional guide versus continental? Well, no one's traveling at the moment, so you might not need to get this one, the um, field guide to all of North America, the National Geographic. It's actually a really good, just bigger than pocket, but still pretty portable one that covers all of North America. If you see yourself traveling in the near future out west, or yeah, you might just want to get a smaller Eastern version. At the end of the day, like there's a lot of species that you're going to find in both the East and the West and just a small subsection of birds that don't appear on the other side of the Rockies. So if you're doing most of your birding in the East, just go for an Eastern guide. It doesn't matter too much, but there's, there's tons of stuff in the library too. So you can get a taste for it. Get a taste for what you want before you drop some money. This is also, I just want to draw your attention to this book, The Crossley Guide. It's pretty hilarious. It's pretty beautiful. It's pretty awesome. He just superimposes like photos of tons of birds all on the same page. You would never, well, unless you're at like Hawkcliffe, uh, see this many red tail hawks all in one go. Um, but it's it's a lot of fun and it, they're pretty, you know, I mean, they're real photos that have been superimposed here. So it's very lifelike. And it's a great coffee table book, that one. So the Crossley Guide does come well recommended. Um, and those field guides, the most important thing, particularly in Stein North, is to really look at those range maps because if you're seeing something around here with a that's black, blackbird like with a yellow eye, um, or you know, it, it, it can really guide you. Basically, this is a brewer's blackbird. Some of you may think it looks a lot like a grackle, but if we were to look at the range map, then that can really give us some clues to help work out what it is or isn't. So they're a super important part of field guides. But apps, apps have become super popular in the last five, I don't know, 10 years. Um, disadvantages of apps, you need a battery, you need your phone to work. If you're out for like, if we're going on a canoe trip, might not be the best way to ID all the birds that we're going to find. Um, you risk breakage of your phone um, and longevity of the phone as well. Like if you're upgrading your phone every couple of years, like which I hope we're not for the sake of the environment, but you know, the app's going to have a, a limited lifespan in that sense. So if you end up dropping the same amount of money, like a lot of like the Sibley app is pretty much the same price as the Sibley field guide. So the bonus is that with the app, you do get the recordings, you get the voices of a ton of those. So that's like a real advantage of the Sibley one. iBird Pro, I really don't know much about that. I forget why I put it in here. Audubon's a good one. It's free. Um, again, has recordings. Um, the advantages, yeah, is really of having an app is that you get all that stuff in one package. You don't have to have separate recordings. Back in the day, you'd have to like get a separate cassette or CD player. Um, but you know, we're kind of beyond that now. There's one app that really, if you're starting off and, and you, you use your smartphone a lot, it, this does come recommended. The Merlin Guide, it's from Cornell Bird Lab um, down in the States, New York State. Uh, and they just do a whole ton of amazing conservation, research, public engagement, outreach, everything to do with birds. Really, they're kind of, they're nailing it all and leading the way. And eBird is, is coming from there. And this Merlin ID guide is from there. And you can upload photos into it. It can guide you based on like really simple observations like size, color, um, and you can, you know, it's going to show you a few different options and it might not get it right every time, but it's going to really help you when you're, when you're starting off. Again, maybe particularly before dropping some cash, before going further on binoculars or 
a field guide. So which brings us to binoculars. So you want to think about whatever you can afford within your budget that's going to give you the least weight. Um, you want waterproof, almost for sure. Um, you're going to have to think about cost and warranty. If you can find a pair, and there's some companies that come with a lifetime guaranteed warranty, um, it's really worth considering. And even like, wh where's where are their maintenance base? Like, where are they going to be doing that warranty work? Because 10 years down the time, um, you know, if you've dropped them in the sand a bunch or in the lake, they're going to be pretty sad and need need some care. So it's really nice having that warranty option. Vortex uh, are well known for that. Um, you might want to think about your magnification. Eight is probably pretty standard and pretty recommended for a lot of people. You could get 10, which is going to give you a bit more power. That's, sorry, that's 10 times magnification. So you're seeing a bird like 10 times closer than it actually is in the field through your binoculars. And so with that more power comes a bit more like wobble and it's a bit harder to maybe find the bird in the bush that you really want to find uh, because your field of view is just a little bit narrower. Um, but super useful if you spend a lot of time out on lakes or if you're going to be out in big wide spaces where you're going to see, be seeing raptors. If you live in the prairies, almost all, certainly get 10, um, 10 times. But if you're doing most of your birding in parks or in the forest, eight is probably good enough. Usually, you're not paying much more dollars for like a little extra magnification. What you really pay more dollars for is like the quality of optics, the quality of glass, and um, also the objective lens. So you really want to try and get a 42. Um, that's going to be like your average kind of size. I don't even have mine around here. Usually they're always by my side, but um, and that's going to give you kind of the best um, the best field of view for a lot of what you want to do in your local parks if you're going on camping trips that kind of stuff um 50 i mean it's only really hunters would use that i think and 36 is good if you want a more portable option maybe if you are like looking at a pair to really take into the back country then getting a little pair which is going to be a 35 mil objective could be worth it um anatomy of binoculars there's some things that are really worth knowing um Maybe you have a pair at home, like an old antique pair, and you really just like don't know how to use them so well. So this, I'm just gonna zip through this real fast. Like often the eyepieces will come out if you wear binoculars or go in uh, if you wear glasses. So that can be useful. They have this little ring on the one lens, often it's called a dioptra, and that's just gonna correct uh, the one side if, if you don't have complete 20-20 vision. So you can mess around with that and figure it figure things out from there. The, the focus wheel, the one in the middle, um, that's the most useful thing. That I always have my finger on and I'm always moving it a little bit one way or the other um, when I'm, whenever I'm scanning through my binoculars. Um, the objective lens, that's, as we talked about, the, um, the one that you're not looking through. It's the one that you're looking out of. And that's the one that's gonna guide like how much light is coming in. The wider it is, the more light, the clearer the image, particularly at dawn and dusk. Um, most binoculars are adjustable, either just like this, um, depending, I have like really shiftily close together eyes. So I always, have, some binoculars just aren't good for me. Like they, they don't come close enough together. Um, there are stores in a lot of cities called Wild Birds Unlimited. And I wholly recommend this store. Um, I don't know what it's like right now during COVID times, but usually they're really good. And I think even during COVID times, they're letting you try the binoculars just out in the parking lot. They'll come out with you and they'll really give you a lot of information and guide you on getting a good pair that's going to meet your needs. Um, and also then they will be the place to bring them back to. If you need maintenance work done, they're going to send it off to whoever's providing the warranty, but they may also give you a loaner pair during that time. Um, so that's the benefit of going through one of those actual like proper birding stores. Wild Birds Unlimited, definitely worth checking them out. Um, this, I live in Guelph, so this um, presentation is geared towards Guelph and Wellington, but you may find this if you're living in Toronto or other big cities that the library has binoculars that you can lend. So make inquiries or just blast it into the search engine, just binoculars, and it should come up as an item. And here in Guelph, you can get them out for three weeks at a time. 
Um, you can renew them multiple times if no one else is requesting them. There's like 10 or 12 pairs in the city. They're never all out. And they're really good pairs. And you can try them out to see if that's a company that you want to buy from. Or just, you know, just if like you want to take some little people out birding with your family members or you just don't want to drop the cash on some binoculars yet. So it's a great option. It's a great way to test like is birding a thing that I really want to get into. Not everyone, not everyone's ready to like commit. Um, okay, I feel like I'm talking a lot, but that's okay because this is my presentation. So tips for getting started. Um, <laughs> let's see. Okay, yeah. Don't. I kind of said this a little bit earlier. Don't worry about getting to know all of the birds. You don't need to identify them all. You don't need to make crazy lists. Um, discovering new ones is a fun process. So if you don't recognize everything on the first day that you're going out with your new shiny binoculars, don't panic. It's going to take time. Um, just get to know, you know, one species at a time. And like getting to know the common ones, your common backyard birds, or the birds you're seeing in the city, the birds that you see through the winter. If you get to know all those super common species, then when new things show up during migration, it's going to be easier to be like, oh, hey, that's something new. And this is the new thing that I re recognize about it or don't recognize about it. Keep your eyes on the bird. Don't get bogged down in your field guide or on your app or in your camera lens. Like actually just spend some time enjoying the bird, looking at it, taking in the details. Um, I used to spend a lot of time like apps are pretty new for me in terms of like eBird and making my list there. I used to make all my lists just on paper and I would invariably like be listing all the birds I'd be seeing and not really seeing them so much. So it's, it's a trap you can fall into. Again, like it is useful, like if you want to get into sketching and that's a great way to learn features. So that might be the only time that you, I'm going to say, yeah, keep your eyes going down and up. But the rest of the time you really want to just spend some time with that bird and use multiple ID clues. Don't just go off one pattern, one color, one feature. We talked about some of the other details we can know about like range maps earlier, but even like visual clues, use more than one. It's gonna really help you out. Um, and again, like you don't feel like you need to figure out the species all the time. Like some of the sparrows, it's like, it's enough to say, hey, it's a sparrow. Um, there's a lot of them and like, Sometimes it takes a while to like be like, hey, oh, that's a sparrow or just a streaky finch or a streaky thrush. There's a lot of brown streaky birds out there. So like just getting them down to like family or group. And we're going to look at a bunch of the family groups shortly is a great starting point. Wow, it's eight o'clock. I'm going to have to pick up the pace here. Uh, learn your field guide. Spend a lot of time looking at it. Okay, next thing. Um, good idea basics. Shapes, silhouettes. Uh, hawks a, a good one. Um, you can really just through the silhouette figure out. Oh, is it a forest hawk like an occipiter, or or like a red tail hawk, like a butio, like an open country hawk? And like these features feed into like how they, well, how they navigate the land, how they feed. If it's got really pointy wings and a shorter, like more narrow tail, could be a falcon, like a merlin or a kestrel. Again, think about what habitat you're in. You're not going to get a merlin in open country, and you're not going to get a kestrel in the city. And if it's really big and it's like the fastest animal on earth that you've ever seen, it's probably a peregrine. Um, and if it's chasing um, pigeons in the middle of the city. Um, what else? Tail shape and length and wing shape. And I'm all over the place right now. Oh yeah, shape of wing tips. We talked about that a little bit. Posture, like how a bird is like sitting up. Um, yeah, everyone suddenly is just like, oh, hey, posture, yeah. Um, but like, yeah, what do they look like when they're sitting up? Well, like, how does that posture change when they're feeding? Uh, bill, like bill size and shape can tell you a lot about what birds eat. And that in turn is an extra clue to help you identify them or just learn a little bit more about them. Um, and also relative proportions. Oh yeah, it's on here. It's just under all your faces here. The, um, the woodpeckers, for example, the downy and the hairy, and it's just a subtle, I mean, the size difference is noticeable when you have one next to the other, but without that, like you really have to use the clue of like how relatively big or small is this bill? Size, we talked a bit about size of 
bird features, but also the size of the bird. Again, it's very hard if you don't have a comparison. So compared to nearby op objects, like that hawk that's sitting on a lamppost can tell you a fair bit about how big it actually is. Um, and that's all there is to say about that really. Color and pattern. Um, yeah, check out the body. Is it streaky or is it solid in color? Um, often the breast is really useful with a lot of our songbirds. Um, the face, is it plain? What's the eye stripe like? The malar or the cheek stripe is often useful. Throat colors. Often like the colors and actually this illustration shows it perfectly with the sparrow. Like you can simplify like those color blocks and like it might not be exactly as this illustration is, but it often appears in the field like that. So you can kind of, the descriptions that you read in the books are gonna throw things into like, yeah, throw color, eye color, malar color. So getting familiar with these terminology is also gonna be useful if you're gonna delve kind of deeper into birds. Um, wing bars are another like major color feature that's worth taking note of. And watch out for variation in females. And also during the season, a lot of birds like all the warblers are gonna be looking different when you see them next in the fall. And even like certain birds through the winter look completely different to how they look in the summer. Not all of them. Uh, and this of course is the female red winged blackbird. And like once the females get really old, like two or three years, they do get a real nice hint of red on the wings. It's super beautiful. They're, uh, what's the word? Under, under loved, I think, female red wing. Um, Okay, context as well. We talked a bit about range maps and geography, um, but also habitat. Look at the description in the book or on the app and like, yeah, is it a marsh or a swamp? Or like if you're seeing a bird, yeah, if you're seeing a bird in your backyard and it's like purple and streaky and you think it's a finch, it's probably not a purple finch because they really like more open habitat. And unless you like live like next to like beautiful habitat, like if you're in the middle of the city, it's probably a house finch. So getting to know the habitat of a lot of these birds is useful time of year and the migration patterns is also gonna really give you more clues um, about what you're seeing because certain birds just like won't, won't be here at certain times of year. Um, other birds only maybe pass through during spring migration and maybe not so much during the fall. Hard to get to know all those patterns and they'll come more with time. But as you go deeper, it's, yeah, it's a good clue. Um, behavior as well. Um, and behavior mostly like, well, I wouldn't say mostly, but often like connected to feeding is a really good clue. Like certain birds are only gonna be eating certain things and that can really help you figure out what they are. So yeah, let's figure out what they are. Um, I'm just gonna zip really quickly through some of the main bird families that you're gonna encounter um, in Southern Ontario. So we got the ducks and the geese. This is one of our most beautiful like city ducks here. Um, you can find them in the countryside as well. The male wood duck, absolutely beautiful. But there's tons of different ducks. Again, you see a lot more during migration than you would see like during just like the middle of the summer. So they often congregate on small bodies of water, little ponds. Um, and a lot of them have gone through already, but like winter is a really nice time to be doing duck watching. Uh, loons and grebes will come through the city too. And you can find some absolute beauties like this horned grebe here. We've got our diurnal raptors. So we've got our hawks, that is red tail hawk. Falcons we talked about. If you live in the middle of the city, peregrine falcon is the bird you wanna look for. They are stunning. And again, like they've, they've come back from the brink of extinction. It's a real conservation success story. Vultures as well. We see lots of them here. Um, and then the gulls and the terns, and most people are really kind of like, who, who really wants to look at a gull or a seagull, if you want to call it that? Um, but they can be pretty fun. And recently I've been seeing, even in my city here in Guelph, like um, these terns passing through and actually they nest all around the Great Lakes and they're a good one to look out for. They're actually pretty stunning. And if you can catch them diving and catching fish, oof, beautiful. Um, we also have other raptors such as owls, again, very common to find in the city. Um, and if we're going to be heading up north, somewhere like Algonquin, you have more chance of seeing some of the, um, the rarer, more northern owls, particularly in the winter time, stuff like Boreal, 
um, great gray owl. I guess you've got to go a fair bit further north for that kind of thing. But Ontario is really blessed um, with its variety of owls. Shorebirds as well, um, like the, the plovers. Uh, we all know the killdeer, I'm sure, but spotted sandpiper, again, a pretty common bird you might see along your city rivers. And again, migration is going to bring possibly up to a dozen different species of um, shorebird passing through um, southern Ontario. And some of them, well, you really want to see a lot of shorebirds, then go to a sewage lagoon. That is the hot spot for checking out. Alex is just like scrunching his face up here. But it's true. It's not, yeah, no, they smell awful. It's true. And it's not really like, I wouldn't take someone on a date to like go shorebird watching at a sewage lagoon. But, but yeah, you'd really have to like know that they're into it. But yeah, it's a great place to see shorebirds. And yeah, I really digress on that. Hummingbirds, we have the ruby throated hummingbird here in Southern Ontario, and they're just stunning. Um, don't put dye in your feeders, no, there's no need for it. Uh, just sugar and water. Um, what is it? Four? Well, one part sugar to four parts water, I think. Just regular white sugar. And then woodpeckers. We are again blessed with including like the pileated woodpecker, the largest woodpecker in North America, which is this is not it. This is hopefully you can all tell by the bill. It's a hairy. Okay. And then we're gonna get into like what are known as the songbirds. And like they're songbirds because they sing, obviously, and they sing mostly to mark the territory. Sometimes it's like males just like out singing each other. And like other times it's sometimes like males singing to attract a mate. The other day I, I learned that female purple finches actually sing. The male and the female sing back and forth, these alternating songs, really beautiful. But often males are just singing to like mark out their territory. And it's a way of like not having conflict. I've noticed Alex does it a lot actually. He just like sings around the outdoor school to like avoid conflict with other staff. Um, yeah, we've got the fly catchers. This is probably the most charismatic one you might see in open country, maybe on the edges of your cities, the um, Eastern Kingbird. And I keep talking about cities. You might be wondering why, you know, Trip, trip Shed is a backcountry <laughs> outfitter, but I don't know. I just, I feel, yeah, I wanna see like, as many birds as possible in like wilderness settings for sure. But I'm really excited about getting people excited about getting into bird watching. And that's not going to happen like in the boreal forest for most folks, you know, it's going to happen in their city. So I'm just trying to emphasize the fact that you have the opportunity to see so many different birds, not all the time, some of them passing through, but in like our urban settings. Great crested flycatcher is another big, bright, beautiful flycatcher that you might see in urban parks. Um, we got blue jays, we got crows, ravens uh, increasingly coming further south and having more interactions with us and with crows. And often you can tell because uh, the crows will just be mobbing the, the raven, but you know, they're stunning and their voice is just amazing and they're so intelligent. Swallows, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of tree swallow, barn swallow, cliff swallow, bank swallow, northern rough wing swallow, purple martin. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of them are in decline. They're really suffering because the insects and insects aren't doing so well. We'll talk a bit about more, more about that in a minute. Um, chickadees and nut hatches and all their friends and relatives, the wrens, the kinglets. I mean, there's tons that I haven't even included here. I'm just wetting your appetite, really. The thrushes. You all know the American Robin. I saw that wink, Alex. Um, but you may not know some of the other thrushes that um, a lot of them, you know, maybe wood thrush breeding here in Southern Ontario, again, critically, well, threatened, I believe, declining. Um, but we also have a whole wealth of more Northern thrushes that are maybe doing better, um, but will migrate through Southern Ontario in big numbers. Sometimes in the fall, you can go out on a clear evening with a soft, gentle breeze coming from the north and you can actually hear birds like this Swainson's thrush flying overhead, migrating like hundreds of kilometers in a night. But on nights when there's a lot of them moving, you can actually hear their nocturnal flight calls and it's super cool. Um, and really, yeah, this is what it's all about. If you're gonna, if you're gonna go out and look at birds one day of the year, probably do it tomorrow or the next, the next day you wake up and feel like, wow, we had some warm air in 
from the south last night because the, we're going to get a real flood of warblers. And we've had a bunch the last couple of weeks. A bunch of them will stay, like this common yellow throat here and the yellow warbler and black throated greens. They'll all breed here and tons more. Northern water thrush, oh, loads. But there's a whole host of them that keep going further north up to the boreal forest, big, big numbers. And a lot of them are coming from super far away. So Northern South America, places like Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, Venezuela, Mexico, big, big journeys. They have been traveling for maybe two months just to like pass through your neighborhood. And they do. I saw a Blackburnian warbler like this, but 10 minutes walk from my house here, right by the university in like, well, in the city. Just like tiny little patch of woods, it was there, boom. So like they, they want big trees, they want the insects that are in them. So that's how you gotta find them. Just find the big trees and there will be warblers passing through right now, the next couple of weeks. And they are gorgeous. And these guys are gonna be back soon if they're not already indigo buntings and all their friends and relatives, the, um, the gross beaks, what else? Oh, and then we've got like, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you all know a bunch of the sparrows. Sparrows are actually really fun. There's probably like 15 different species that we can get here at any one time. Some of them are way more beautiful than this song sparrow, but this one's pretty charming, pretty regal looking. And this is kind of the de facto sparrow that you're going to see around a lot of the place. Get to know its song, just get to know them. They're pretty feisty, they're pretty fun. Uh, cardinals, finches, a whole host of good feathered friends. Okay, here's some online resources for you to check out. Um, Birds Canada, um, they're really like the, the primo um, Canadian conservation and bird education and outreach organization, doing a lot of fantastic work. They have tons of resources. They run a lot of the citizen science projects, stuff like Project Feeder Watch, which would be a great program for anyone to like try as like an, a, a way to like get into birds and also contribute to citizen science maybe show your grandkids or your kids or your, your, your pet gerbil or whatever. Um, you know, just the birds that are at your feeder and contribute to citizen science. So um, check out Birds Canada. They got a ton of good stuff. Actually, this first link, um, it'll ask for like where you live in Canada and like the kind of habitats that are around you. And then it'll draw you, not draw you, it'll give you like a photo list of birds that you can expect to see around. So it's like a tailor-made list to, um, to where you're living. It's a really good little tool, again, before you get your field guide. Um, the Audubon, again, website is there, and they do have a pretty fantastic, um, just like their app, all online on the website version. Recordings, maps, the lot, and allaboutbirds.org, that's the, um, the Cornell website, and they got a bunch of really good resources there. And then finally eBird, that, this might be like the next step for a lot of you, or it might be where you wanna start off. It can show you, um, yeah, what birds are being seen um, around your area at this time, who's been seeing them, like um, who's passing through, what am I likely to see? It's also a great way for you to record all your own observations and keep track of them. So you can look back, uh, you know, in a year's time or like in a week's time or whatever and see like what you've been seeing historically, keep track of the number of species you've been seeing. It's a really useful tool. Um, I don't want to get into it too much now. We're a little bit pressed for time and we want to have some time for questions. But here's the rub. Compared to 1970, there are three, ah, oh, I didn't go back and change this, but I'm pretty sure it's actually 3 billion fewer birds in North America. So in the last 50 years, we've lost nearly 30%, that's one in four birds have gone. And there's, there's tons of reasons. There's climate change, there's human development. There's so many reasons, there's pollution. Um, some of these birds are doing better, like ospreys, bald eagles. They've come back from the brink of extinction. Peregrine falcons I talked about. Some of the shorebirds, some of the ducks are doing great compared to what they were doing 50 years ago. But we've lost species already here. Um, like in the last 200 years, so since colonization. And we're gonna lose more if we don't do something about it. So, you know, a lot of it's for like big industry and like governments, but we can all contribute and we can do it by, you know, <laughs> engaging with those high authorities. I don't wanna get into all this political stuff right now, but like what can we do as individuals at home? 
first of all, let's keep our cats safe away from coyotes. And that's also gonna like keep birds safe because cats, believe it or not, contribute to more visible recorded bird deaths than any other factor in North America. Then car strikes, window strikes, wind turbines combined, cats hand down like 10 times more, at least. Like the, and that's not just like domestic cats, that's like feral cats as well, but they're all coming from a domestic source originally. Kittens getting dumped in the countryside, stuff like that. So keep your cats indoors, or if they're gonna be out in the yard, put a massive, put 10 bells on them. Like, cause they will kill birds. Even if they're not bringing them back to you, they're doing damage, I guarantee it. I love the cats, but they're evil for birds, like big time. Um, reduce window strikes, like turning lights off at night. A lot of it's, we know about big high rise buildings and like there's a lot of legislation going into building code now to improve that kind of stuff. But if you Google um, in your city, like bird safe networks or bird safe windows, Toronto, you can get some really, cool tips on how to protect your own windows because uh, it happens. Birds hit windows a lot, they get confused. And so there's a big push now to improve that. And you can have really innovative and beautiful designs to do that. And this a friend in Guelph had this done on her window the other day. And I think that's just gorgeous. Um, avoid bird vehicle collisions. I mean, you can't always avoid them, but driving at the speed limit or slower, particularly in rural areas, particularly between May and August, because that's when all the young birds are out. So you're not only gonna protect like humans by driving safer, but if you're really mindful about it, when you're in the countryside during the summer, you can like make a difference. And better consumer choices, getting shade grown coffee, which, uh, you know, they leave the canopy intact. So there's habitat there for the birds, um, you know, buying, <laughs> Again, it's not easy with COVID, but like less plastic waste, reusing what you can before you recycle. All of these little things can help because the less plastic we're putting out into the environment, you know, I see the amount of plastic I see in birds' nests and like it visually, it's like crap. And like, it, it's probably not great for them getting tangled up, but there's also like, what's the impact of like chicks with their like tiny thin little skin, like resting in like a, bed of plastic you know it doesn't sound great to me but make your yard bird friendly keep the cats indoors but also plant native plants give them shelter i don't just mean yeah putting out feeders if you're going to put out feeders keep them clean but yeah providing shelter is key so native planting is fantastic oops i didn't mean to do that um support your local nature and conservation groups that's pretty obvious and like a great way to connect with others again during this time when we're also disconnected right now but overall yeah just go birding get excited about it you're going to discover more you can share it with your friends with your family and that's what's going to um, increase your love of birds and increase other people's love of birds and that's really all we need is to like understand them and love them a bit better to protect them um, yeah i think i'm going to throw it back to alex Pat, thank you so much. That was awesome. I'm wondering if maybe you want to throw off the share screen um, and we can uh, take it to a bit of a chat. If there are questions, by all means, now is a great time to throw your questions into the chat and Matt will do his best to answer them. There we go. Did you see any good questions earlier, Alex? Uh, bu -bu -bu um, what do you recommend for our area as far as feeders? Yeah, I just saw that one. Um, well, right now is a good time. I said hummingbird feeders, um, they're pretty fun. And, you know, it's, there's nothing better than seeing a hummingbird up close. Um, and they're really easy to maintain, you know, don't overfill them change the water every like three or four days, particularly once it gets hot. Don't need to put dye in it. It's really not good for them. And just pure white refined sugar. Like they don't want honey. They don't want fancy organic sugar. Apparently that's really not good for them. Um, so just regular refined one part sugar to four parts water. I didn't um, realize people put, put 
dye in the water. Why do they do that? Yeah, like red dye, I think that the thing is that you want to attract them. Like they don't know how a feeder works. So they're going for the visual cue. They go into the red that looks like a flower. Mm. But often the feeder is red anyway. And if it's not, it doesn't matter because by the time they get here, they've probably been born up here. They've gone all the way down to Central America and come all the way back up. So they've seen other hummingbirds feeding at feeders and they've learned how to do it. So they know. Like birds are pretty smart. And a lot of these birds, like they don't, like they don't necessarily have like olfactory senses, all of them in the same way that we do. So they're not smelling seed and stuff. They're seeing other birds do it and hearing them and copying. So it's pretty cool. Um, I would also suggest black sunflower seed is great for attracting lots of different kinds of birds. It'll bring in finches and blue jays and nuthatches and chickadees, cardinals, all that good stuff but it will also bring squirrels in. I've recently had some luck with safflower, which brought in mostly just the chickadees and cardinals, but no squirrels. And then also you can get um, some seed called niger seed that is really good for finches. And again, like the squirrels don't like it. Um, so that's gonna be great for your um, goldfinches, but also if you put it out in the winter, well, we just had a really good winter year for finches. So next winter might not be so good. Not every winter is a finch year, but niger seed is great for it, particularly in the winter, yeah, for finches. Um, what else? Like if, if you're really having issues with squirrels, I've heard that cayenne pepper mixed in your bird seed helps because the squirrels hate it and the birds can't detect it. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, I see a couple of questions coming in here as well. Um, what is the best time of day to see bird activity? Great question. Depends on the time of year. Um, you know, in the in in winter, you could go any time of day, and if you're in the right place, like it doesn't matter too much. But and even even now, it's not getting so hot early in the day that it matters too much. But you know, generally it's going to be early morning is the more active time. The birds are going to be most active singing first thing in the morning. So if I'm doing breeding bird surveys for like um, for research or for, for consulting work, like I have to be out at like the ass crack of dawn because like that's when the birds are doing the most singing. And that's when I really need to know who's out there. But if you're just doing more casual birding, it doesn't matter. Activity will drop off particularly as we get into June, it starts to warm up, like come, I don't know, 10 or 11 o'clock noon, but then it picks up again later in the day. So come four o'clock. Um, so mostly morning and evening. But again, if you want to find owls, like you want to be out like really like beyond dusk, stuff like that. So it depends what you're after, but good question. Uh, Orange, yeah, orioles, orioles love oranges, uh, just the half. I would say just a half orange, but they're pigs with them. They'll go go through them like no one's business. Um, and the best time of year to see Orioles, Southern Ontario, especially around Kingston. I imagine they're back in Kingston already, or if not in a few days, because they, they've been back in Guelph here like the last week or two. I've seen reports in Toronto. I bet they're there already in Kingston. So maybe it's just finding the right habitat. And so I find like big trees along the river here in town seems pretty good. Like not like the built up areas of town, but more like the, it's hard to describe if you don't live here. Um, yeah, where there's like quite big trees or like urban parks, but you might not need rivers even. They seem to like the water, but yeah, I would say like, just like big trees, big, big city parks would be the best place to find Orioles. Um, just like picking through questions here, Alex, unless you saw good ones. Mm -hmm. All questions are good. Anyway. Uh, oh, Blue Jays. Someone's commenting about Blue Jays. You've never seen them in groups before. Blue Jays are weird because, yeah, they'll just be in like small family groups or pairs, and then they do congregate and do migration, but they do visible migration. Like they're not migrating like the warblers and thrushes at night. They're doing it during the day. And so sometimes you can see big movements. And I feel like in the fall, maybe you saw this, Alex, we saw like pretty much every jay in Guelph leave 
over like the course of a week, every morning, it was just like tons of J's, like hundreds mm -hmm. just moving. And recently a bunch showed up early spring. And then more recently, they seem to be coming back. And like, I'm literally seeing them fly like West. No, sorry, East. And like, they were flying West before. So they don't do regular North South migrations. They just do weird stuff depending on like their food resources. And yeah, they're, they're weird, weird birds. So I can't really explain that. Probably they're coming back after migration. Could also be that a group of them failed to breed early and then they just form like a non-breeding posse to just like hang out recklessly for the rest of the summer. The bachelor, grackles. The bachelorettes hanging out at the parties. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. Uh, what should we do about invasive species, i.e. starlings? There's not much we can do about them at this stage. Uh, I don't know, if, you, if you're getting like house sparrows nesting, in a box that you put up for chickadees that's a different matter because they will they will come in and like knock out chickadees or even like kill the young and take over the nest so if you see how sparrows building a nest and you don't want them feel free to like it's like one of the only nests in north america that's not protected by legislation you can like actually remove that from the box a house sparrow but beyond that i don't think there's much you can do them with uh, about them at this stage um, I mean, I could suggest things, but I don't think it would go down very well. Uh, my favorite bird, that is like a question I get asked all the time, and it's the one that I can never answer. I have favorites, peregrine falcons up there, or oh, indigo buntings probably there or thereabouts, those blue or co cobalt-winged parakeets that I saw in Ecuador were mind-blowing. Oh, there's, there's so many, there's too many. Purple sandpiper, oof. Um, but I love some of the really common stuff as well that, that we do get around here, like blue jays. Do I love blue jays? I don't know. I have, I have contempt for blue jays, but they're impressive. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, I enjoy John Young's What the Robin Knows. Can you recommend any books along those lines? Um, I can't. I'm afraid, and I've not read that one, and I maybe should. But if you, you could check out, I don't know about books, but you can check out a guy called Dan Gardoki. He does do really good like nature mentoring and like teaching like folks how to learn birds by sound. So he's worth really checking out. In terms of books, I'm afraid I can't help you on that one. Oh, a specific question about robin nests. We had a pair who nested under our back balcony last spring. We left the nest there over winter and now a pair has moved into the nest. Rebuilding it, yeah, they'll like refurbish it kind of thing. What are the chances that this is the same pair? Yeah, great question. Or perhaps the same female with another male. It could be the same pair because a lot of the robins don't go that far and they are like a lot of birds are pretty like site specific. They'll come back to, if not the same spot, then like the area that they come from. It could be, I, I couldn't say for sure, but I, I do like the suggestion. Oh, hey, it could be like the same female with another male. My inclination might be, and, and maybe this is just like, I don't know, maybe this is because of the patriarchy or something, but like, it could be the male, like that's more likely come back to the same spot because they have the territorial, like, um, what, what's the word? Like they're, they're more attached to like the land, the territory, to their territory than the female might be. The female might be a bit more flighty. I, I don't know. It's a great question. My blue jays seem mean. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, blue jays can be mean. I've heard about blue jays taking or like killing wood thrush, baby wood thrush, all kinds of havoc. Um, is migration based off of temperatures each year or based on daylight hours? Ooh, good question. So like the birds, like what are they? Cause, cause like I follow migration a lot but I'm going off like wind direction a lot. Like if for me to know it's gonna be a good day to see migrants tomorrow, I'm looking at like, what's the wind doing tonight? Which direction is it coming out of? Is it strong? Is it weak? Ideally I want a light wind out of the South to bring birds here. But if you're talking about the birds, like how are they doing it? I think a lot of the time it's like, the fact that the daylight is diminishing. 
more than temperatures. I think it's like mostly daylight based. And then apparently it's like stars. I mean, like horizon, but also stars that are guiding them. Because again, the songbirds, a lot of them are going at night to avoid like disruption from solar rays and less predation as well. So a lot of the songbirds are migrating at night. Do I have a bird that I'm seeking to see? Um, someone reported a yellow-headed blackbird in Wellington County two days ago. And I haven't gone to see it because I feel a bit weird about going to like Twitch something during COVID. Twitching is when you go to see like a known rarity in a known rare spot. And I've seen yellow-headed blackbirds like down in Texas where there's hundreds of them and or thousands. And I've also seen them at Long Point. I've seen like one or two there as like a rarity. But I don't have them for my Wellington County list. So I am tempted to go and see it. Um, but I've been waiting a couple of days so that the crowds like yeah, die away because a lot of people might have gone to see that bird. Um, and beyond that, oh, I've been to the Grand Canyon twice to try and see um, Californian condor. No luck. So that might be one that I really want to see. Uh, Robin seems to have an endless supply of songs. Yeah. Oh, and mimicking a grackle. I don't know if Robins are known for their mimicking. It might be coincidence, maybe, but there's definitely some birds that really are amazing mimics, like the obviously like the mockingbird, but also its relatives, the catbird and the brown thrasher. And it's actually the brown thrasher that has the greatest songbird vocabulary of any bird, apparently. They can sing like thousands of different songs. Incredible. Um, I've not heard of Robins mimicking. Blue Jays a little bit, but I, I might look into that. Do I aspire to be another Norm Chesterfield? I don't know who that is. If it's like a super Canadian reference, I might not get it. <laughs> uh, there was one question that I think may have uh, slipped by, and then maybe we'll take one or two more and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up just to honor time. But what's your current research on? Ah, I'm, I'm not actually like doing research at the moment. I have worked more <clears throat> as a technician for bird observatories where they have long-standing commitments to monitoring. So population monitoring activities. Um, I don't actually have any of my own research at the moment, but I do have some, again, if COVID wasn't going on, um, some plans to do some collaborations with some local um, ecological farms around Wellington County. Um, and particularly helping connect like their landowners and uh, to encourage more like monitoring of their bird populations. Um, yeah, I, I wish I was more involved in research, but I'm not, there's, there's no money in it, unfortunately. So I got to do the stuff which I love, which is like workshops and teaching and I have to like offset it with a bit of consulting, unfortunately. <laughs> but yeah, good question. What's the most exciting bird that I've seen ever? Oh, that's a really tough one. I don't know. A ring-billed gull. No, no. Like, oh, but actually a kind of gull. Probably, yeah, the most memorable bird for me of the last five years might be a Sabine's gull up in James Bay in Northern Ontario a couple of years ago. I've done some work up in shorebirds up there. That was pretty amazing. And actually I told Alex a story the other day about a cerulean warbler or two that fell into my nets when I was working at Prince Edward Point Bird Observatory. They were pretty stunning. So yeah, Sabine's gull or Sabine's gull and um, cerulean warbler. Yeah. Is it inadvisable to play back recordings of bird calls? I've heard it's a bad idea to play owl calls, for instance. Uh, again, I, I do do this as part of, I guess, as part of monitoring activities and volunteer projects or um, research, if you want to call it that. Um, but it, it's a, not advisable, I would say, for folks to be doing it unless you know what you're doing. So because you could end up doing it at the wrong time or too close 
or disrupting um, activity. So when, when I use it, I'm using it to conduct a survey on a specific species that is perhaps um, less known to just sing on its own. So like owls are one or like marsh birds are another one. They're kind of hard to survey and they're under surveyed. So we have to use standardized recordings to, um, to, to do that kind of monitoring. Um, and we might, you know, I might use a playback if, say if like I'm birding like uh, in town on a May morning and I hear a warbler that I've not, you know, that I've not seen for like a year and I, I have an inkling what it is, but I'm not gonna blast it really loud because it, one, it might disturb the bird, but that bird's not breeding there. So like the disturbance in that sense is less important, but it's gonna annoy other birders because they're gonna hear it and they're gonna be like, oh, what's that? So th there's other considerations as well. It's a great question. And like I, w I have played calls for that reason, but I've tried to do it quietly so that I'm just like hearing it to compare rather than actually playing it to to like encourage something to come in. Good question. Um, what I might do more so is like pishing, which is like making a noise like a psh, 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 which imitates an alarm call. So again, I'm not gonna do that like into the breeding season or if I'm really close to a nest or if a bird's at visibly agitated, no way. But if I'm again, like um, trying to like see what that war migrant warbler is up in a tree, then I might pish to encourage it to come down to see to see what noise I'm making, I guess. Uh, Matt, this this feels like a uh, a natural spot to wind down. Um, so first of all, I just want to extend a huge debt of gratitude to you, A, for coming out this evening and for the awesome work that you do in the bird world and in the nature connection and environmental education world. It is a pleasure to work alongside you. Um, so I'd love it if, yeah, if you'd all like to join me. I saw this the other night on a Zoom call for the first time and I thought it was great if you have the capacity to uh, throw up one of these little hoot and haul us to show some gratitude and some thanks to Matt um, for joining us this evening. Uh, I will just say as well, um, this was a great snippet and a great sort of introductory uh, talk into birding. August 20th, Matt and I are going to be guiding a three-day, three or four-day backcountry canoe trip in Algonquin Park where we'll be taking a much deeper dive into a lot of this content uh, it's a fully guided trip, fully outfitted. All you have to do is show up with your clothes on your back and a willingness to get a little lost in the world of birds. Um, I'm going to throw the link for that trip on the chat right now. If you are so inclined to have any questions, please do reach out. Uh, there are seven spots available and we would love to have you. And the best part is you get three days of uninterrupted access to Matt and ask him all the questions you want about birds. Uh, it's later in the summer, so I think during the migration period, if I'm correct, Matt? Hopefully we're going to see a little bit of, a bit of both, like early migration um, and also like some late signs of breeding. It's going to be a best of both worlds. Hopefully I can prime you for the fall migration. I'm planning to bring spare pairs of binoculars from the library and like ID guides, a little nature museum I have. Like, yeah, it's going to be a blast. We're going to see lots of great stuff, not just birds, but hopefully lots of birds. Osprey's there. Uh, Carrie, it is absolutely good for beginners, these trips uh, that we do. So at the Trip Shed, we have uh, a number of workshops happening throughout the season. Just if you want to check out our website in general, um, a lot of information there on the different trips and some of the gear that we carry. But they're all designed to be easy beginner trips as far as distance covered, um, routes planned, you know, amount of paddling and portaging, uh, with the focus being on getting to dig into some of the content like this. Um, so definitely check it out. If you have any questions, let us know. And thank you all so much for coming out to join us this evening. It's been a pleasure to see this many folks getting some interest in, in, uh, in birds and trying to really quack the case on this whole birding thing. Right, Matt? All right, well. Yeah, it's a mystery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and also check out, watch out for future workshops and opportunities, private guiding in the Wellington and Norfolk counties. As well as Trip Shed, we're doing these workshops about once a week lately for various topics. We've got one coming up shortly, I believe next week, on solo canoe tripping. So uh, lots of fun stuff ahead. And I hope you all have yourselves a lovely rest of the evening. The last invitation I will leave you is to get outside for even five minutes tonight. 
go see if you can spot a bird or two or 20. And uh, Mark, I see you're outside there right now with a beautiful sunset behind you. So that looks great. And that's all. Thank you so much and have an awesome rest of the evening. Take care, everybody. Good night, folks. Thanks so much. Good birding. <laughs>